Hello, art history students. This video lecture is going to introduce Baroque art, which is uh, in period of art in the 17th century from about 1600 to 1725. It, we're focusing, it's a movement that focuses on Europe. And in this lecture specifically, we are gonna look at some artworks from Italy and Spain. So first, some introductory information about the Baroque period. So Baroque, they think potentially comes from the Portuguese word um, Barocco, meaning an irregularly shaped pearl. Critics in the late 18th and early 19th centuries started using this term. They viewed this art as having deficiencies compared to Renaissance art. Gardner has a great quote about this. They say, whereas Renaissance artists reveled in the precise, orderly rationality of classical models, Baroque artists embraced dynamism, theatricality, and elaborate ornamentation, all used to spectacular effect, often on a grandiose scale. And that really is what we're gonna see here. So if you think of the luxury of the pearl, but the excitement of the diversity in shape that you get from irregularly shaped pearls, I think that's kind of the spirit of this term. So something that's going on or uh, had recently been going on is the Counter-Reformation, where the Catholic Church pretty much resisted Protestant objections to using images in religious worship and insisted on the necessity of educating the laity. Baroque art, therefore, was often overtly didactic, very much designed to teach something. So they really try to be a little more in your face in the presentation. It's often trying to guide you towards explicitly learning religious content rather than avoiding imagery. So one thing they're doing in the Counter-Reformation is trying to revamp interest in re both relying on the Catholic Church, having an interest in worshiping in a church, making churches very appealing. And the Catholic Church really starts innovating throughout this period, buildings and so forth to make them very appealing and to really like guide worshipers to certain aspects of their ideology. So, in they uh, finished St. Peter's, which was a big goal. And then on top of that, we get the increased power and influence of French kings, which is really going to shift the interest. Well, I guess we should say the hub, sort of like the hub of the art world, gets shifted from Rome to France. And France becomes the center of modern art and innovation. We also have the Thirty Years' War that goes on, which of course literally goes on for 30 years. That's one of the nice things about the title of that war, is at least it literally is 30 years. I've always thought to myself how insane it would drive me if the Thirty Years' War did not actually take 30 years. That would literally make me feel crazy. But it does actually take 30 years. Now, we don't need to know a lot of details about the Thirty Years' War for the sake of our class, but really there's sort of like a couple core facts we need to know. One, it devastated Europe, which of course, whenever a civilization or region is dealing with devastation, one of the first things to go is art making. If you're just focused on survival, you're really not focused on creating beautiful works of art and you're not getting a lot of patronage of works of art. That money is going towards survival, so towards wars, towards warfare, typically towards surviving, whether that be a plague or an enemy civilization or whatever is coming at you. But art making gets kind of cast to the side. So the Thirty Years War really was a culmination of religious wars that were happening throughout the 16th century, Catholics versus Protestants. German princes wanted secular power back. Now, in 1648, of course, we get the Peace of Westphalia, which is where it kind of became this declaration that different leaders would get to choose 
what religion their people would be to try to increase a sense of religious freedom and basically stop all this fighting because you really can't have one leader says one religion then the next leader says another then the other leader says another and you just have this kind of chaos so they're trying to have some consistency and respecting each other's religious freedom to have some peace with this situation there's a lot of other factors about this that we could consider but for the sake of our art history class the idea of allowing a religious freedom is kind of the core idea that we need to know so a little more info we have in the baroque period an interest in manipulating space and creating theatrical effects as i mentioned earlier you're gonna have architects trying to draw your eye and physically draw you into certain parts of a building or structure to emphasize certain religious values or ideologies when you are navigating that space they also like drama and when you like theatrical effects and drama that also tends to lend itself towards pretty intense contrasting of light and dark there were the classicists that were influenced by Raphael, and then there were the naturalists, which were inspired by Titian. And Baroque architecture is associated with grand and majestic royal courts. One of your vocabulary terms that you need to know this unit is quadro riportato. Quadro riportato is a ceiling design in which painted scenes are arranged in panels that resemble framed pictures transferred to the surface of a shallow curved vault. This here, this work, Loves of the Gods by Annabale Karachi, is a great example because you really do see this emphasized here. You have a lot of frames so many frames it's as if you took piles of paintings in their frames and you fit them into this barrel vault and there is some overlapping in these images because of course they are not physically framed paintings that they bent and curved to fit into the vault it they are in fact painted scenes so there is a, an interest in illusionism at this period the golden frames have a feeling of three-dimensionality and it feels like you could reach up and grab one of these paintings and pull it off of the ceiling but in reality you could not do that they are painted these images directly onto the ceiling this became very fashionable over this century Another vocabulary word that you're studying in this unit is desado in su. It means literally from below upward, which is a perspective view seen from below. So here in this example, a glorification of St. Ignatius, which is a ceiling painting, we have the walls of the church are foreshortened into painted architecture. So we feel as if there's architecture jutting up into the sky when in reality, this is, of course, an illusion. So it looks as if this ceiling is opening up to the clouds, to the heavens, but this is, of course, once again, an illusion. Now, it looks as if the figures are hovering above us, and the intention is for us to feel this illusion as we gaze upward, craning our neck directly above us. Each figure in this image was studied from life, they're very robust, healthy, muscular figures, highly idealized with very defined contours. Caravaggio is famous for his non-traditional depictions of religious scenes. This is really where we're gonna get to see that contrast of light and dark that I mentioned earlier. So he's using, of course, perspective because there's a high interest in perspective dramatic lighting the chiaroscuro right that in that contrast of light and dark to bring viewers into the painting space and action almost as as if they were participants so generally with baroque art we are often getting a sense that we are part of the scene even in the earlier work the idea that when we're gazing upward we go back 
Oh, this does not let me go back a slide. Okay. Well, if I were to go back a slide and we were to look at the ceiling and we saw the architecture jutting out into the sky, it's a feeling as if the sky is opening up above us. And we could also potentially float up to the sky. So there really is an interest in including the viewer in the scene. Now, we have a specific vocab term here called uh, tenebrism from the Italian tenebroso. So sometimes you'll see tenebroso. It means murky. This is very dramatic illumination. It's a style of painting using very pronounced chiaroscuro where there's violent contrast of light and dark. Darkness becomes a dominating feature of the image. So here in this image, the calling of St. Matthew, we do have that tenebroso. Light comes from two sources on the right. The top source illuminates St. Matthew. You wouldn't know just upon glancing at this work that this is a religious scene because they are dressed in daily clothing. They're in a humble space. They are not in an ethereal or heavenly space. So it's a little unassuming at first. They really just look like ordinary figures. Some are even dressed pretty fashionably for the 17th century. The dandies, you know, very fashionable. And there is an influence. If you look at the hand gesture right here, you'll see that that looks very familiar because in Michelangelo's creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel, the hand is very similar to the hand appearing in this work, The Calling of St. Matthew. So the figures are very closely spaced together. There is some awkwardness in the body positioning. It's not the most legible or easy to read who each of these figures are. And there's very much a lot of movement in the figures having different body positions, very engaging body language. Each of them has very different expressions. So this is very much an in-action image. There's not a lot of depth to the piece. It's actually kind of a shallow space that we are in, very much pushed forward towards the viewer. So who are these people to get a closer look? So we have St. Peter, a sturdy figure with cropped hair. He is facing away from us. So we're only seeing the back half of his body. Christ is actually depicted much more youthfully, very slender, delicate. There he points his hand at St. Matthew. He has a very much a kind of more delicate appearance than the other figures in this work. Matthew is pointing to himself in disbelief after Christ tells him, like, come with me. So Matthew is a tax collector. He's sitting with his coworkers while they greedily count money in the dark back room. So there they are, greedily counting their money. They're armed figures. They're dressed pretty fancy. And once again, this is not a holy space. He is very much, Caravaggio is very much stepping away from the traditional places that you would see a scene featuring Christ with any saints. It would have been a contemporary environment for the time that people were living in. And if you're interested in the life of St. Matthew, you can go ahead and click this link to read more about his life. Now here, Baroque painting in Spain, we have Diego Velasquez, Las Meninas, the Maids of Honor. I have had the wonderful pleasure of getting to see this artwork in person because I did live in Spain for a year. I lived in Madrid and I did get to enjoy the Prado Museum. I would love to work at the Prado M Museum someday. It really is a awesome space. So in this work, we have Velasquez working on a huge canvas that could not fit through the doors of this room. 
He is pausing and taking a step back to study us, the viewer. Once again, with Baroque art, us, the viewer, are being included as almost a part of this work. And again, you can see that the figures are thrusted forward into a more shallow space, as if we are standing there with them. He wears the cross of the Order of Santiago, which was a symbol of nobility. Uh, he was a painter that enjoyed a, quite a, a court appointment, and he definitely desired to be well-respected. Having a court appointment as an artist was a pretty prestigious and lucrative and highly coveted role. Any painter who gets to be a court painter, who gets to have his work be commissioned by the elite of the elite, either the king or queen themselves, or other elite members of the family, or even other no nobility, because remember, you have the elite nobility, and then you have regular wealthy people. Like, being a regular wealthy person versus being a noble is not necessarily the same level of status. There is the elite nobility that would be even higher up than just your average wealthy person. So here we have Princess Margarita, who is the feature of my slideshow because she's just adorable. Oh, look at that cute little face. So Princess Margarita is here featured in the center of this image well slightly off center i suppose but really she is illuminated the most so she stands out everyone knows that she is the star of this piece she has two maids in waiting and she is of course the central focus now we do actually have dwarves on the right of princess margarita philippe oh pardon me well I'm Philip, Philippe. Philippe the Fourth had a large collection of dwarves, which really I'm trying to think of what I was getting at here about no physical differences. Oh, oh, I see. Yes, 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 yes. It is very clear that they are putting distinguishing features of these figures that would make it very clear to anyone looking at this work at the time that those um, people would be identified as dwarves. Now, we have a blurring of figures on the right, which suggests the painter's interest in understanding a peripheral vision, because even though the artists aren't necessarily obsessed with having a perfect vanishing point or perfect perspective, they do have an interest in this time of optical illusion, depth of space, and the idea that when objects are farther away, they are blurrier. Okay, so the older woman is a lady of honor. She's wearing a nun's outfit that indicates that she is a widow, and the man in conversation with her is her escort. The silhouetted man here is Jose Nieto, the aposentador, let's see, aposentador, hmm. the chamberlain or usher of the queen, head of the queen's tapestry works. Now he rests his hand on a tapestry as he goes out, but he is pausing. So as we consider the use of geometry and perspective in this image and the use of space and composition, something to consider is that we do have a contrast between the figures that are very close to us, the viewer, that are pushed frontally into our space, they have a lot of feeling of movement and irregularity to them, as opposed to the framing and, and posterior imagery towards the back of the piece and framing the piece, where we have a lot of sense of geometry and orderliness. So it kind of creates this juxtaposition between uh, the what's not as important which is all of the framing behind the figures but is visually engaging and the scene that we're pushed frontally in where we have the irregular uh, nature of all of the movement of the figures and a little bit more chaos now the mirror that you can see 
reflects out towards us and yet the figures in the in the frame I mean that doesn't look like me that's a man and a woman and we'll talk about that in just a moment now we also have a very dark subdued background in a lot of ways and uh different areas emphasized using dramatic light and dark so of course this figure our gentleman in the back he is once again his silhouette is beautifully framed by the contrast of his dark clothing and the light radiating behind his body we have light illuminating our princess the most she shines the brightest as well as some light illuminating on her attendants and other figures so thinking back on the figures in this mirror well who do we have but the king and queen and this is where there's a little bit of speculation regarding this piece because theoretically what would we maybe see in the mirror maybe ourselves after all we are drawn into the space so if the king and queen are in the mirror are we supposed to be representative of the king and queen or is it just reminding us that this is where the king and queen would be this is what they would be witnessing and also what is velasquez working on because here we have this massive canvas in this space as i mentioned earlier a canvas that wouldn't even fit through this doorway and he's clearly busily working on it and yet we don't know what it is so is he painting this group is this a painting of what we're seeing here is he painting the king and queen there is some obscurity and mystery in this work but it does kind of serve to keep the viewer visually and intellectually engaged it's a bit of a puzzle we're trying to solve in looking at all these different figures figuring out who they are what their status would be the artist is kind of celebrating his craft as well as his prestige you know highlighting that he is a court painter but also of course the beautiful princess you cannot deny as she gazes at us that she is the star now we have the ecstasy of saint teresa which is featured in the cornaro chapel at the church of santa maria de la vittoria in rome italy this work is by gian lorenzo bernini it's from about 1647 to 1652 marble stucco and gilt bronze notice there's a lot of interest in decorative qualities in the baroque period and one of the ways that they accomplish adding decorative elements is through the use of stucco and of course painting painting this or laying on gold right to add some actual luxury to the work so you're going to be reading more about this work on the Khan Academy article because I, I really like this article by Khan Academy but there's part of it that I want to feature and read for you here so who is the woman that this event is happening to this is Saint Teresa she's Teresa of Avila who was a nun in 16th century Spain at the height of the Reformation she wrote about her visions in several books here is her description of the scene shown in this artwork beside me on the left appeared an angel in bodily form he was not tall but short and very beautiful and his face was so aflame that he appeared to be one of the highest rank of angels who seemed to be all on fire in his hands i saw a great golden spear and at the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire this he plunged into my heart several times so that it penetrated to my entrails when he pulled it out i felt that he took them with it and left me utterly consumed by the great love of god the pain was so severe that it made me utter several moans. The sweetness caused by this intense pain is so extreme that one cannot possibly wish it to cease. 
nor is one soul content with anything but God. This is not a physical, but a spiritual pain, though the body has some share in it, even a considerable share. So as you can see, there's definitely potentially some sexual undertones here. It's a very intense spiritual encounter, uh, very physical, very visceral that she feels this encounter. And something that Khan Academy describes with this, which I really appreciated, they say, we know that an important goal of Baroque art is to involve the viewer. Teresa explained her vision in this way to help us understand her extraordinary experience. After all, being visited by an angel and filled with the love of God is no common event. How can we, caught up in the realities of life, hope to understand the intensity and passion of her vision if not put in terms of our own human experiences. Mm. Okay, so I will let you keep reading about the ecstasy of St. Teresa. It's going to break down some imagery of other parts of the chapel, and I, I do appreciate the way they break more of the scenery surrounding the ecstasy of St. Teresa in um, the, how they break more of that down in the article. Now, one thing I definitely want you to note when you look at this artwork is the interest in framing the scene with these golden rays emanating onto the scene, as well as the interest in drapery. I cannot help but feel that there is some influence of Michelangelo in the way this drapery is used. This may cause you to recall Michelangelo's Pietà, especially these folds throughout the lower figure. There is a distinct contrast between these heavier folds, right, of our human figure here versus the very delicate, clinging, almost wet drapery, thin wet drapery of our angel. Now, Baroque architecture in Italy, I love this quote, an art of persuasion, symbolic and illusionist themes appealed to the emotions and intellect of the viewer. Mm. So here we have San Carlo alla, <clears throat> pardon me, San Carlo alla Quattro, Fontaine, Rome, Francesco Borromini, 1665 to 1667. So here you can already see this is not like the typical building we have looked at before. We have a high interest in curvature, concave, convex, undulating curves. This building has a lot of theatricality to it and a lot of interest in both welcoming, you know, urging you into the space jutting out into your space, this undulation is undeniable and it creates very much a three-dimensional quality to the structure with deeply recessed niches. So here we have four concave bays that lead into a central convex balcony and a projecting edicule, which is a shrine within a temple containing a statue and is framed by two columns and a pediment. Here, I couldn't resist but include this architectural drawing of San Carlo alla Quattro Fontaine because it kind of breaks open the building and it gives us a sense of both the exterior and the interior, which is just a really exciting image to have. You can see this image is where we actually see the lantern that historians have described as emitting a supernatural light down into the interior space. The undulating walls, as we look at this floor plan, emphasize the ovular ceiling dome. Now, there is an interest in mathematical symmetry and geometry. I included this diagram. Now, this diagram was featured in the uh, Khan Academy video, and they break down 
this geometry a little bit more, but I kind of just include this image so you can get a sense of what I mean by this term, mathematical geometry. Even though this is a very much curvilinear space, they are using very much a sense of scale and geometry and orderliness to this space to actually kind of, I mean, it does add to the dynamism of the space and it shows both a hearkening back to the classical interest in geometry while also trying to innovate and reinvent that interest in geometry in a more exciting way. So we have a feeling of movement and kind of a sense of earthly and heavenly coming together. The space has a sense of order to it, which is very much something that human beings understand, but it also has a sense of movement and otherworldly feeling to it. The earthly and the heavenly come together. Now the rich variations on the oval create an interior that appears to flow from entrance to altar, unimpeded by the segmentation characteristic of Renaissance buildings. And you can see that they have an interest in kind of creating like lobes. They uh, architecture, um, architects, pardon me, refer to it as lobing. So they do kind of look like these lobes and Historians have made a connection between this concept of lobing and the mandorla, which was very much a medieval shape, a medieval silhouette that they liked to uh, use as a framing for religious imagery in the medieval period. Now, this floor plan includes surrounding structures which I like to include so you can see that this is very much a small church that was part of a monastery. And you can see the cloister and the dormitory and library. So this is also, there's a fountain. So this is kind of a smaller component of a functional larger space. It's still not a large space, I wouldn't say in general, but it's kind of a small feature in that space. Now, some people, I mean, you cannot help but notice, really, notice the cartouche on the top, an oval panel that has crested or scrolled borders. Now, here you can see it is, here it is, circle it for you, and it is held up by angels. And I want you to notice once again, these angels bring dynamism even to something as minimal as this cartouche. This was used on palace and church facades as a framing device, often for a crest or coat of arms. Now, we have a complex lobed entablature, so I thought it might be useful to see what we're referring to as entablature, both in the interior and exterior spaces. And we have kind of this, uh, labeling so we have the entablature what it would look like in the interior and what it looks like in the exterior so we have this lobed entablature now the deeply coffered oval dome cannot be denied this is where we say the lantern would be on the exterior. So we would have the light, the supernatural light coming down through this dome from that lantern. And the light kind of floats and emanates down. It has some spaces that emit light. As you can see, one of them is shown right here in this image. There's other light that's casting in from some of the lobes like you see in this other image. Now. At the center of our ovular dome, we have a dove, and a dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and this refers to a group known as the Trinitarians, which were a group whose main focus was the study of the Holy Trinity. In order to create this space and add all this decoration, they're using a lot of inexpensive stucco. So while the space feels really luxurious, 
the use of stucco is extremely common during the Baroque period and is used for a lot of decoration. Some classical elements that you probably already noticed, particularly are the attached columns and these ovular coffers that fill these lobes that feature little rosettes, kind of reminiscent of the Pantheon where each coffer in the Pantheon featured a golden rosette. Something really engaging and you, what would feel unique from what we've studied so far of coffered ceilings or domes in general would be the fact that they're using a lot of different shapes. We have hexagons, octagons, crosses, and these different shapes, even though they're geometric, they create a lot of dynamism and make it feel very intricate. It's not just your regular coffered ceiling. There's a lot of intricacy and a lot of stimulation for the eye as you look at not only all of these different shapes, but because they're fit into a, a curving space, a ovular dome, they also tend to get a sense of different scale uh, based on, of course, the illusion of the eye. The ones closer and deeper into the center of the dome feel smaller, while the ones featured and outstretched more on the sides of the oval feel larger. And if you're curious about the courtyard at San Carlo, they have a two-store uh, loggia courtyard. And a loggia is a gallery or room that is open on at least one side. It may be part of a building or separate, and it may have piers or columns. And so if you were to be able to go into the courtyard of the San Carlo, this is what you would see. Okay. Next on our list, we have Il Gesù. Il Gesù, Rome, Italy, a church, and most people just call it Il Gesù. Brick, marble, fresco, stucco, those are the main materials we'll see. So Gesù means Jesus. The building is actually mainly a Renaissance work, and we'll dive more into that in a minute. It was consecrated in 1584. The floor plan was by Giacomo Barazzi da Vignola, who was the architect, and the facade was developed by Giacomo della Porta, who was also an architect. This was at the time during the Renaissance, the mother church for the Jesuits. It features really counter-reformation architecture. And what does that mean? Once again, remember during the counter-reformation, there was a high interest in having any architectural space for religious purpose bring the viewer's attention to certain details. For example, in this case, a focus on the altar and Eucharist. What is the goal, as they say, as historians say, for Counter-Reformation architecture? To triumph over Protestantism. They typically wanted to have a design that they considered full of clarity and accessibility. They do not want people to reject the church or reject the space of the church. They very much want people to be eager to make spiritual connections to God through the experience of being in church. Now, this structure actually is very close to the Pantheon. So here is an image of our facade. Now remember, this facade is from the Renaissance period. So we have the main patron, which is uh, a cardinal, a very, very powerful cardinal, who was also very much a lover of art. So we have a powerful figure, Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who is commissioning this work. So you can see influence, because this is a Renaissance period facade, and you can see that it was actually influenced by a slightly older facade, which is Alberti's Santa Maria Novella, particularly with this kind of scrolled 
framing pieces that we see in the shape and silhouette of this facade. Now, one thing to note is that one particular feature of Italian Renaissance art is the use of light and dark, the contrast of patterns created with light and dark. It might seem reminiscent to what you remember seeing in the archways in the Hagia Sophia, where there's some Islamic influence. It very much has some of those qualities. And this kind of dramatic architecture, typically when you see a work like this and you see that use of light and dark stone and the elaborate nature of the geometry, and you get a sense that it has, um, that it is from the Renaissance period, it is usually Italian. So looking at the floor plan for Il Gesù, there is a very wide nave, 25 meters wide, in fact, featuring many side chapels. And the purpose of all these side chapels was to be able to accommodate very large crowds. And they're creating an interesting architectural space here a modification from the cruciform shape that we have gotten comfortable with because there are no side aisles. So structurally, the shortened transept actually does not extend past the chapels. As you can see, the transept and the chapels are pretty much almost directly in alignment, pretty close, which really makes this church when you look at the uh, full scale of the floor plan here, the silhouette of this floor plan is really a rectangle. There's a focus on this hugely wide nave, and that of course creates a large crossing square, which means of course a large dome. And remember, this is very close by to the Pantheon. And the Pantheon would have been the dome, you know? Um, and we know that for example, Brunelleschi's Duomo was inspired by the Pantheon. The, the Pantheon is inspiration for all of these artists at this time. And remember, the floor plan of this work is from the Renaissance period. So they're doing something slightly innovative here by having the chapels on the, on, um, having chapels along the aisleways and getting rid of the aisles rather than having say radiating chapels which you would see let me draw what would have been radiating chapels we don't have radiating chapels which i love but we do have these kind of chapels that take the space of where you would have aisles which is so neat and creates kind of this super wide rectangular space now this really actually causes the apse and altar to be thrust forward into the viewer's space. So if you were in, walking through this nave, you would see this huge crossing tower square, right? This, that where we're gonna have our dome. And then you would also see almost immediately a very shortened space between the altar and the crossing square, bringing the altar much closer to the space of the worshipers. Once again, as I mentioned, it's very much a purposeful choice in we don't want a lot of side aisles. We want a clarity. We want to be able to hold a lot of people and we want people to remember what the focus is of this building. And that is our altar. We now, we are not necessarily studying all aspects of this work, but I feel like it only, you can't really look at the interior space without at least looking at a photo of the dome fresco. We're not going to dive into all of the imagery of the dome fresco, but you can see that they do have an interest in creating light to illuminate the space of our dome. They have an oculus as well, bringing light downward in. And we have the interest in illusion, the feeling of the figures floating up into the space. You can see the figures are, it, it feel, you feel that illusion that these figures in the outer areas are also rising up into the dome. So now we're getting into the Baroque imagery. 
So here is another image of an architectural image that I just thought would be nice to include in this work of Il Gesu, featuring the facade, the floor plan, a look of the interior silhouette, as well as a different viewpoint here. So I thought you might enjoy seeing this image. Now, the interior walls in Il Gesu were influenced by classical Greece and Rome. You have the fluted Corinthian columns and pilasters made of Sicilian jasper, ochre marble, and other rich materials. These kinds of materials would have been recycled from ancient Rome because they're luxurious materials, and where do you get access to those but recycling them? And also, though, you also have cheap painted stucco used throughout the space. Now, the Baroque interior frescoes are added later from about 1676 to 1679. The one that we, have, uh, that we are focusing on for the sake of our AP Art History class is the Triumph of the Name of Jesus, which is the ceiling fresco by Il um, Basiccio, also known as Giovanni Battista Gaoli. It has a lot of stucco figures. There's the Khan Academy video if that interests you. But let's dive in. So here we have the apse fresco, just to give you a sense of the luxury. And once again, that interest in illusion, the feeling that the figures are floating up into the central space. But really our interest lies in the ceiling fresco. So in the ceiling fresco, first of all, Notice there is so much appearance of gilded, corbelled ceiling. And you would use a lot of stucco to create this decorative corbeling. All of these little rosettes look really luxurious. Now, those who are saved in this piece would be floating up to heaven while the damned, you can see all the damned predominantly here, spill out being cast away from heaven towards hell. And there's a lot of use of foreshortening to create this illusion. Now the fresco extends onto the vaulted ceiling. Now how do you do that? They actually use wooden boards. And those wooden boards allow for the fresco to extend out onto the architectural surface creating the illusion that the figures are literally spilling out and into the space. So here, they used a dark glaze on the edge of the wooden board. You especially notice it here where I'm um, drawing, where you see the clouds billowing outward. That's especially where you see that dark glaze, and it makes it seem like there's a very deep shadow, and that this cloud feels very three-dimensional, even though it's on a flat board. And spectators often notice that it can be difficult to decipher the figures amongst the billowing clouds and all of the drapery. It's a lot of kind of muddled busyness, now, this ambiguity was considered very acceptable for the time and really was a stylistic choice. You didn't need to know who every figure was to understand that some of these figures are the saved and some of these figures are the damned. The message is still clear, even though a lot of the figures are not easily discernible. So, once again, I want to emphasize the barrel vaulted ceiling with this extremely decorative corbeline so that highly decorative interest and very much inspired by the corbeline of the pantheon and you have a lot of windows actually that you may not have noticed at first featuring all kinds of sculptures and all of these sculptures just continue to facilitate the three-dimensionality, the illusion they're creating, the feeling that the figures are real, that the space, that what's happening, things are really opening up to the heavens. We could float up with these figures if we make the right moral choices in our life. 
that will lead to us being welcomed by God into heaven. It's been highly decorative, lots of movement, lots of use of foreshortening. All of that illusion is there drawing us up. The ceiling opens and it's really quite magnificent. The luxury is there, so much gold, so much dynamism with the contrast of light and dark. The damned feel damned. They are swept into darkness, cast away from God's light. The, the initials IHS appear in a lot of different places in Il Jesu, and this is a couple spots where you see it. On the exterior, we have it. On the center of the um, holy light, you see it, and as well as this beautiful gilded, emanating, decorative medallion that we have at the base of the apse mosaic or pardon me, not mosaic, the apse fresco. And IHS is possibly referring to Jesus' name in either Latin or Greek, and it does appear in multiple spots throughout inside and outside the building.